right, what's up you guys? We're back with Behind the Bikini episode 26 now. We're, we're rolling right along. Uh, we're into the new year. We're kind of getting into a groove. If you haven't done so already, like, comment, subscribe. Uh, we got a lot of really good comments and input on the last couple of videos. So that's good. That's the engagement is increasing, which is awesome. Keep sending in photos or photos. <laughs> Keep sending in qu questions. Questions. <laughs> questions <laughs> and know. topics. Yeah, questions, topics, things for us to clarify, all those kinds of things. Um, you know, again, as we get into the season, I think people start getting into prep. And, uh, and those kinds of things, and those questions start popping up more. So uh, there's no, I always tell people, but there's no stupid question here. Uh, a lot of times it seems like it's, some, it's simple, it would be a simple answer, but there's actually uh, a lot more to it than you would think. So um, keep going with that. So uh, we are going to talk about training intensity today. Uh, we feel like this is a hot topic. A, we're, I mean, I know we're both trying to increase our training intensity personally, um, but also just on the whole topic of like videoing and, and gyms and Instagram famous, you know, fit, fit fluencers and all those kinds of things. Um, what's the difference between being an actual athlete and a, and a fit fluencer, I guess, basically. And we're going to show you how to be different than a fit fluencer. <laughs> so bodybuilder. <laughs> all right. So before we get into all of that, how's everything going with you? Updates and off season and all that stuff. Uh, pretty status quo. Nothing really crazy this week, which is nice. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, just just training, just training, working. Um, yeah, a pretty straightforward week. How about you? <laughs> I know, same thing. I mean, you know, since I was in Arizona, you know, all of my training has changed. So this was the first real full week. I still haven't finished the full week, but the full first full week of the new training, which is very different because I'm not used to having so many rest days. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, this is weird. I'm like, I don't have to go to the gym right now. So I'm, I'm just going to go do some more work because no right. time, you know, so, um, but it's been, it's been good. It's been challenging me in a different way. And I do feel like, um, engagement in my body in a different way. You know what I mean? So that's a good thing. Like I, I do feel like, I don't know how to describe it exactly, but it's like my, my glutes almost feel like they're pumped all the time. Like, I'm not sore, you know what I mean? Like, it's more like uh, they're activated all the time. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know if that makes sense. But like, even Definitely. when I'm doing my steps and my walking and like all that kind of stuff, I'm like, okay, I'm like, I'm like hitting my glutes as I'm walking. Like when I'm walking my dog down the street yesterday, I'm like, all right, I'm like engaging my glutes while I'm walking kind of thing. It's, it's yeah. different. It's weird. Um, in a good way. I mean, you know, it's like, it's like I said, I almost feel like I have a constant glute pump. <laughs> I mean, that's the definition of true mind and muscle connection, right? And yeah. like getting in those deep, deep muscles and full lengthen and full contraction. And you become a lot more mindful when you slow down that way and you start feeling the different connections in the gym and whatnot. It, it does translate, you know, through mm -hmm. everyday life for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so that's yeah, it's, awesome. been a it's been a different kind of week. Um, you know, I've been walking my dog more because I got to keep my steps up. So the other thing is like where I really get my, my steps in most of the times I work from home is by going to the gym. So since I'm not going to the gym anymore, I'm like, all right, well, I guess I'll take Dolly for a walk. She's going to lose a few pounds. So, so she's like, go, she hates it. She absolutely hates it. But it, it, she cracks me up. I put, I put uh, videos up from yesterday because she gets so excited when I get her leash out and everything like that. And then we start, we start walking up the driveway and she's like, no, fuck this. <laughs> she's like, no, we're done. So like, I have to drag her up the driveway to drive a steep. And then like, she's just, she's pretty good when she goes down and then we get around the corner of the street. She's like, we're, we're still going. Like, why are we still walking? <laughs> like, I don't keep why going. are we going on a walk today? Mom? <laughs> I know. She's like, I want to go home. And she'll just sit there, like kind of stop and look at me. And I'm like, no, no, you no. You get I'm a really carriage good. for her. That way you can take her. But... but she's, no, she's got, she needs the, she needs the exercise. That's the whole thing. Like I need her out there moving. So I was like, no, we're going to, we're going to go a little bit further every day. We're just going to go a little bit further every day. And like, we get to a certain point where we turn around and go back home. And all of a sudden she realizes we're going back home. She starts sprinting. She's like, oh, we're going home. <laughs> yeah. She wants to go home. <laughs> she cracks me up. Um, I think part of it is the exercise, but I think the other part of it is that we don't have Elvis with us. And like, that's her security blanket that's her big brother and like we, she goes everywhere with him so it's like when he's not there and he'll be at home freaking out the fact that he's not with us <laughs> why don't you take both of them it's impossible it's impossible he's um yeah. elvis is a big kid like he has to sniff every mailbox pee on every mailbox like he just has to like 
he won't move. So yeah. what I do is I get home and then I let him out into the front yard and then we go up and down the driveway for, you know, play fetch and all that kind of fun stuff so that he gets his exercise in too. But I can't take him on an actual walk. I've tried. He doesn't walk. He <laughs> <No>. stops. <laughs> no, <laughs> he stops and smells things. Or if he sees kids, he goes running after the kids. He loves kids, loves kids. So if there's kids, we're not moving. Like he's, there was one day where he, we let him outside to go to the bathroom and the kids were all going to the, the bus stop. He was at the bus stop. Like he would have gotten on the bus and gone to, gone to school so with the cute. kids. That's so cute. <laughs> Yeah, he's um he loves loves kids, loves kids. Maybe so you much. take Elvis on the walks to the bus stop every morning. <laughs> yeah, but then we don't get him to come home. That's the problem. True. That's True. the problem. He doesn't Just send come him home. on the bus. They'll return him at the end of the day. <laughs> True. <laughs> yeah, he we we always laugh because like he's he's gosh, we don't, I think he's I wanna say he's like eleven at this point. Wow. But, you, but you wouldn't know it when you when you let him outside. Like you think he's a puppy. Like he's just like he just goes gung ho. It's just, mm-hmm. <laughs> and he's and he's a big boy. Like he thinks he's he thinks he's Dolly size, but he's 110 pounds. You know. So people people are like, oh. like he's a yellow he's a yellow lab. He's like the sweetest breed ever. You know what I yeah. mean? But still, you've got a big dog coming after you. Like he just wants to he just wants to snuggle. He, that's how he, that's how my guy my big guy is. He just goes yeah. right for the humans and he goes yeah. right up for a hug and but it's yep. like the golden, but it's still yeah. scary when you got the mask coming at you. Uh-huh. Like, yep, I'm like, if exactly he's it. friendly, he's just coming for a hug. Yep, that's exactly right. Yeah, that, I mean he did that when I because I got to meet your dogs in Arizona. I did that with me immediately. Mm-hmm. Brought me yep. a special toy. Yep, brought brings <laughs> the special toys, wants the hugs. Yeah, I like, Oliver I'm like, bypasses you, you, dogs every day. I know. It's like it's like that, that the whole meme is like when the dog picks you and you at the party, like you feel special because they both came to me. I was like, yes. Yeah. <laughs> they like I feel me. like that at the party, always the dogs find me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm that person. I'm the dog whisperer. <laughs> always. Always. I love it. It's the, it's the best feeling ever. It Bunch is. of dog lovers on this podcast. <laughs> Right. Um, so yeah. So anyways, back to the training aspect. So that's been going good. And it's like, because I'm training differently, it is a, um, I have to concentrate really, really hard. And you know, this. like, I mean, because you do the same kind of thing. It's like, it's, it's not just physically exhausting. It's mentally exhausting. And I leave the gym and I'm like, oh, okay, I need a nap. <laughs> I need to lay down. <laughs> yeah. It is. It is. Especially on glute days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) You have to connect to every little thing. And it's so, because I sent Drew a couple of videos of me doing the the couple of exercises. The one where I had a hard time connecting to was um, the leg on the, on the bench. Uh, RDL. Yeah. The single leg RDL with the leg propped up. Yep. Yeah. Because my legs are so long, I, I don't get a whole lot of bend because otherwise I start going into the wrong places like one of my legs and all that kind of stuff instead of saying it's my glutes and hamstrings and all that stuff so it's funny I was like by the time I got to the last rep of that the last set of that I was doing I was doing pretty good but the first couple like you can see in the video that like a guy came around to the back to the cable behind me and I completely lost it because my my concentration was broken and I could just see my whole back bend and everything and I'm like oh hmm. it's so it's so here it's yeah. so here and I'm like I could see exactly where I dropped it I could see exactly where I lost my form and it's because I was watching the guy or you know, on my peripheral vision going to the cable machine versus me versus paying attention to what I'm doing you know what I mean so yeah um, it's, it's, and that's it's where lot. people all the time they're like you look so like intense and yeah. you're session yeah and I am like yeah that's why I get very frustrated when my headphones are on and people try to talk to me in the gym it's not because I don't want to talk to you it's because I am very focused on what I'm doing Mm -hmm. um and very intentional about what I'm doing and as soon as that focus is broken I lose all of it you know um Mm -hmm. and people you guys will see my logbook here in a couple of minutes for what I prepared for you but people will get a logbook or you know a training program that Drew and I write and there's only four to six exercises on there. And they're like, really, that's it? And I'm like, yeah, if you do it the right way, it should be challenging. Yeah. Um, so you're experiencing that now and more resties yep. and needing the resties and things like that. And that is kind of the difference of like what I say, mind and muscle connection all the time, but true mind and muscle connection is absolutely taxing. And mm-hmm. exhausting if you're doing yeah. it correctly. Yeah. Like when I did the first set of the, the static lunges, I was like, oh my God, my legs and everything are shaking. I was like, I can't hold still. I was like, I'm going to fall over. And they take forever. <laughs> yes. They take forever because you're going so slow. Yeah. 
cycle, you know, when people are going up, down, up, down, up, down, wait for 30 seconds, do it again, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, an exercise takes five minutes. Now this one is now taking 15 minutes. Correct. Yeah, exactly. Just blowing the, yeah. Yeah. And, and even just the, just the stretching, because I, I mentioned to Drew, I was like, my stretching took like, took like 25, 30 minutes to warm up. He's like, that's a little long. I was like, I'm like, yeah, but I was, I was like, honestly, I said a lot of it because I foam rolled a lot. My, my, you know, my hamstrings, my adductors and all stuff are very, very tight. So I foam rolled a lot. And I was like, I, I think once I, once I get into that a little bit better, I said, I don't think it'll take quite so long, but <laughs> it took me a while to just get warmed up. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah. But like, and it's just, but also part of it too is like now that I get into that area and I can feel it, like it feels intense, but it feels really good when I finally can get stuff to release and it makes a difference. I mean, again, I can connect to my, to my glutes a whole lot better now than I could before just because I'm loosening it up enough. And I can get in there and I'm like, oh, okay, there it is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. I've, I've said the prep and prime work for me has been a game changer this season. So I'm, I'm, I'm a huge believer in that now for yeah. sure. Yeah. And on other aspects, um, I've started working with a handful of new clients and stuff like that with FitBody, which is awesome. Um, I, it's, I, I'm, I'm trying to like, it's not even the, the program It's like going through and being able to use the actual like apps and stuff. So I'm like, I'm trying to teach myself how to do that versus relying on asking questions a lot because I'll learn better just from screwing it up. <laughs> basically. So I learn better by, by like, it's hard to go through that, like train your eyes and try to figure out where I'm putting things. You know what I mean? And I'm like, so now I'm like, okay, this is taking me a really long time to put this together. You know, we have a, you know, we have a coaching call today about, I know, I know okay. yeah, I'm, I'm on it. Oh, trust Good. me. I'm on it. Good. But like, that was the whole thing. I'm like, I want to figure out where I'm having problems first. You know what I mean? Like rather sure. than just asking, okay, where do I find this? How do I do that? Where do I, yeah, of course. Where do, I do that? Of course. You know, and I, you know, Yvette did go through and, and do the training for me and stuff too. But again, it's like, it's not until you actually get in there and start working on stuff that you start realizing, oh, this is, this is, I don't know. I don't remember what I just did. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I'm like, that's, it's just taking a long time. <laughs> but that's okay. I'm learning as I go. Um, and now I won't forget either. Now I won't forget where stuff is supposed to go and how it's supposed to be laid out and all that kind of thing. And it'll get easier once I get used to using it more, but um, just the little things you don't, you don't think about like taking extra time, you know? Um, but that's been fun. That's been really fun to be able to put together new programs and kind of get an idea of, you know, feeling I, I've been, I've been having a good time getting to know the new clients and stuff too, cause I'm doing the lifestyle stuff too. And it's been fun. So I actually really enjoy that. Um, what else? Oh, I got my, I got my period on, um, yesterday. Oh, wow. That's funny. I've been, <laughs> I've been cramping again. <laughs> Well, I was saying like, cause last month I was late by two days. This month I was early by two days. So just even right back out. I was actually really I had, happy about I had that. Pretty much all my clients early this month. Yeah. I don't know if it's five week month or something last month. I don't know. But that's I don't know. something. I but I'm normally like right on the 28 days. And you know, last month I was 30. This month I'm, I'm 26. So I'm like, okay. Well, Average it just, out. Yeah, it just worked <laughs> out. You know, and that, and that was, you know, coming out of out of show prep and stuff. That's something that I'm like, I, I want to make sure that my, my hormones are level. And that's something that we that we figure out as we go along. I've mentioned that a thousand times. We did a posing clinic here in the DMV uh, this past weekend, the Victory and Posing Clinic. I saw that. That looked awesome. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Um, you know, they do, they split it up into days. So like uh, bikini, all the, all the women's divisions were on Saturday. So I was helping with bikini. And um, <clears throat> what they typically don't do is go into stuff like that, go into like the reverse dieting and going into all the, the prepping stuff. They usually just go into just posing stuff, but uh, like they, they hand me the mic and they started to ask me questions. So I was like, okay. <laughs> It's like let's let's dive in let's go i'll take this opportunity so, <laughs> right so we did we talked a little bit about prep stuff we talked a little bit about reverse dieting and and you know just the and I, that's why i reposted this in my stories yesterday too it's like it can take you anywhere from three to six months just to be normal after a prep you know so don't don't think that you can just jump right back into a prep again i see that a lot we've talked about this before people right now are wanting to jump into shows in the spring when they just competed in like November, it's like, we well, got to give your body a chance to even recover, let alone make any improvements, you know, give your, give yeah. your body an, an opportunity to do that. 
you know, and I mentioned that even with myself, like it wasn't until the last like three or four weeks that I started to feel like I'm, I'm starting to get normal again from competing in November, you know? Sure. And, and I went to dinner with, with Dan for Valentine's Day and look at the photos. I'm like, holy shit, where did all this muscle come from? I was like, I don't, I don't remember my body ever looking like that before. Yeah. You looked amazing in that red like, dress. Holy crap. I'm jacked. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, it was, it's, it's, it's like a reality check. We talked about that sometimes. It's like, you don't think about, because you see yourself daily, you know what I mean? And it's not until you like look at photos or something like that and you're like, holy crap, you know, in a, right. good way or, in a good way or a bad way. This was very much a good way. You know, I was like, I, I guess I am actually putting on a lot of muscle. You know what I mean? Yeah. We forget about that. We forget about just in the daily grind at how much we can actually change our bodies and things like that. So the reverse aspect of it is very, very important because I feel like that's that time frame where it's almost like you can get newbie gains again. You know what I mean? It's like your body's primed and ready to, to get, to get those gains again. But if you don't do your reverse, right, you won't, you'll, you'll go the opposite direction. You know what I yeah. mean? Yeah. So, sure. yeah. Um, so that's where I feel like I'm, I'm at right now. I feel really good about it. So I was like, oh, good. That's awesome. <laughs> I'm like, I'm doing all the things, all the things right. Again, why I don't want to prep right away because I feel like things are going in the right direction in that regard. Yeah, that's 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 fantastic though. I'm so happy for you. It's so yeah. it's so great to have that mindset when you're this deep in improvement season. So what yeah. a good good spot to be in. Yeah, hey, and I got I got a good team of people behind me that, that's helping with that, you know? Absolutely. So, Absolutely. That's key too. That's key it too. is. I mean, if I had done this on my own, there's no way I'd be where I am right now. Oh, in my, in God. my my space. There's no way. Me there's no either. way. No, mm -hmm. absolutely. It's a, it's a team effort. It takes a village. <laughs> it sure does. It sure yeah. does. And I'm thankful for it because I think back about, you know, I've been in this industry for 15 years at this point, and I've never had the kind of support that I have now with, with Fit Body behind me. And, you know, and I just feel like it's getting better and better. I see these, I see these posts all the time where girls are like, I'm 35. Am I too old to start this? And things like that. And I'm like, Dude, I'm 42 and I feel like I'm just now hitting my stride. Like I just now I'm actually doing it right. You know what I mean? No, you're, you're, Absolutely. you're good. Yeah. You know, you're good. Age like, is an attitude. And that's yeah, what I always say. Uh -huh. And I think that it's also a, your attitude's affected by who you have surrounding you and supporting Absolutely. you. And who's in your corner and who's in your ear and who you're looking at or looking towards. Like who's your aspiration? Like that is all a part of that attitude. You know, if you're around a bunch of other 42 year olds that are like, oh, what was me? You know, I don't want to work on my fitness anymore. I'm too old, blah, blah, blah. Well, that's how you're going to feel. But it's right. restaurant by 42 year olds that are like, age is just a number. I'm going to do this. Da, 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 da. Then you're going to be in that attitude as well. So yep. it's all on who you surround yourself with. And, you know, I agree with you. I became my, the best version of myself when I joined Fit Body, you know, yep. when I had a great that believed in me. I was surrounded by all the teammates backstage. My husband became better because he was starting to see what kind of husband he wanted to be with, you know, the examples of Jamie and Greg and mm -hmm. maybe examples of what not to be with our clients who don't have supportive husbands and things yeah. of that nature. So it's all in who you surround yourself with. And through this journey of bodybuilding, which it really has nothing to do with bodybuilding, it's how I changed as a person for the better, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I weeded out a lot of people in my life because yeah. it didn't really match what my style was anymore, what I was working towards anymore. They didn't make me feel a, a certain way that I wanted to feel. So yeah, yeah, it is. It's, 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 it's really important to surround yourself with those positive people. Well, I think you've, you've uh, also mentioned that's been a big change for you in a positive way for, you know, moving out to Arizona and, and doing all that too, and being around the people that, that are the positive influences in your life. I mean, it makes, it makes a big difference what, what you surround yourself and consume daily you know? Yeah. And I didn't realize too, until I moved out here and until I pulled myself in, out of that environment, what that environment was doing for me or not doing for me. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, as women, we get so used to being the martyrs and accepting, you know, less than feeling good or feeling healthy because we take care of everyone yes. as females. Yep. Um, and then until I kind of removed myself and got back out here or got out here and I'm like, wow, like, my stress is completely low. I didn't realize, you know, from my childhood and all the traumatic events I went through, how much driving down that same road that I've lived on the past 30 years of my life affected me and how much memories are down that road that I don't see anymore. Yeah. So, you know, that, that 
a feeling or that emotion tied to everything around me. It's just not there anymore, you know? So environment's everything. I just had a client check in with me yesterday and she was talking about how high her stress is because of her job. Well, at some point you choose your environment. If you know that you hate your job day in and day out, go choose a different job. You know, and I'm not saying go pick up your life and quit your job tomorrow, but you choose your life and you choose where to spend your time. And if something is, is continuously worse and affecting your mental space and you know it's not going to get better you need to choose a different environment mm-hmm. absolutely yeah. I think we get, <laughs> that's right no no no. i think we get stuck on that sometimes because we get comfortable in situations it's like this is just what i've always known so this is mm-hmm. what i'm always going to do and until you sit back and like you said just really evaluate where you are you start thinking is this really what i want to do yeah <laughs> is, this, is this really it is this really is yeah. this like there's other options and there's no timeline on this stuff like we talked about you know ages and attitude well so is what you do in life too like there's nothing out there saying that you have to be a certain thing or have to do it a certain way you know we talked about this with with me pivoting with my business and pivoting with now you know coaching clients and things like that for the longest time i didn't want to make that move because it's uncomfortable you know it's it's uncomfortable to make that move but at the end of the day if that's where my my heart is and that's where i'm I'm, i want to go what is stopping me other than me you know what I mean? And the same thing with, you know, this happened last year. I, I did, I can't remember if I talked about this. I don't think I had, I had been approved yet for media for Arnold when we did our, our podcast last week. It was the same thing with doing the media stuff. Like for the longest time, everybody told me I was crazy for trying to, you know, boost the women in our square. You know, there's no, there's no money in it. There's no this, there's no that, whatever. And that kind of thing for a very long time. And then, you know, and then last year I got approved to cover the Arnold for media and I was like, holy shit. And then this year I got approved again and I'm like, holy shit again, <laughs> you know, but it's just like, you know, it was, it was, it was one of those things that was uncomfortable because I'm putting myself out there and like, you know, we know everybody in the industry, everybody knows us. So if you fail, like they know you fail, you know what sure. I mean? So it's like, it's a, it's, it's, it's a risk. It's, it's uncomfortable, but that's the only way that you're going to create something better too, you know? Yeah. So you Without risk, you don't get a reward. So yeah. Yeah, you got to get out there and try. Take the risk. Mm-hmm. And it's like you know, it's people would say people would say to the blue in the face. Well, nobody else is doing it that way. That doesn't mean it can't be done. Correct. Doesn't You're just going to be the it. one that that makes it done. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. And yeah. if it doesn't work, who cares? At least you tried. You know, yeah. I try to tell people that too. It's like, it's like, what would you rather? I'm like, would you rather sit back and question, well, what if, or would you like to go out there and see, and fail? Okay. That's fine. You failed. Yeah. You can move on. I'd rather say I tried and I failed versus I got scared and didn't do anything at all. <laughs> yep. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And that goes with anything in life. Absolutely. Because at the end of the day, that's all we've got. We've got, they talk about, I think, did Greg mention this? Was it the dash? The dash. The dash between your birth and your, and your death. The dash yeah. is where everything, where everything happens. That's all we got is that dash. Yep. You, know, you guys so. can Google that. It's called the story of the dash. It's, mm-hmm. it's powerful. It's a very, it's probably six to eight sentences, but it is powerful. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, So. you know, at the end of the day too, and I tell people this as well, it's like, if you do fail, it's like, yeah, maybe people will laugh at you for uh, like a minute and then they move on with their own lives and they don't care anymore. So it's like, I always say with risk too, like if you're doing something that, you know, somebody puts down or says it can't be done, it's probably something that somebody else wants to do and they're too afraid of. And they're just, they're trying to kind of block you or put their own fear on you. So yeah. You know, be the courageous one. Courage gets you to where you want to be. And a failure is a failure in that moment, but it's a learning moment as well. So mm-hmm. for success, you're going to have a, a lot of failures because that's how you learn what success actually is. That's right. That's right. That's right. You know, I mean, we can see it from, you know, the standpoint of every major person in history. Like you look at Thomas Edison, what is the, the deal? Like he had to fail a thousand times before he actually got the light bulb. You know what I mean? But look at how much that changed our world, you know, like stuff like that. Like you, you're going to fail. It's okay. It's all right. And if you would have stopped okay. at any point, would we yeah. have had the light bulb or would we have found that discovery? He <laughs> never else. stopped. He was on an endless pursuit, right? Okay. Yep. This one failed. Change this. Do it again. Nope. Yep. Okay. And that is life. And, and yep. that is all really good in the sport of bodybuilding as well. There, we talk about this all the time. There's going to be a lot of failures before you find that win. Yep. Uh, some people are lucky on their first, you know, few shows and they're winning, winning, winning. Yeah, great. But most people have to kind of climb up those ladders and learn, okay, this didn't work. I need to build here. Come back. Mm-hmm. Okay, this now is better, but now I need to do that. And you just keep making those adjustments. Absolutely. Absolutely. So 
Let's jump into the adjustments. All right. <laughs> training intensity. For training, yeah. <laughs> so the first thing we're going to um, talk about is the reason why this is kind of a hot topic is I don't know about your gyms, you know, where you are, like, frequent things like that, but a lot of the gyms I go to, we see this a lot where it's all about the selfies and the videos to go on Instagram and you see the tripods all over the gym and all this kind of stuff, which in, inherently there's nothing wrong with that. But then you got to go back to the question of, are you doing this to better yourself as an athlete or are you doing this to better yourself as an influencer, a fit, a fit influencer? You know what I mean? Which neither one of those is a wrong answer. You know, neither one of those is a wrong answer. But if your goal, say you're an NPC athlete and you want to become a pro, if your goal is to become a pro, you better be training with some intensity in the gym because there's a lot of people out there who are and they are going to beat you if if you're not doing that and if you're just doing it just for the gram, you know what I mean? So um, I wanted to share the couple of things that you, that you sent to me. So let me find the photo. So before you pull that up, I mean, that that is relative, but I want yeah. to talk about maybe what, what you said, right, about the fit – influencers versus okay. bodybuilding. So yep. there are so many times. So obviously as a coach with anybody that's on my team and Drew's team, I'm only going to speak about our teams because I know our teams. Um, mm -hmm. We build their training for, from them. So mm -hmm. front to back, side to side, sets, reps, tempos, everything is very individualized for the client and what their needs are. So there are some clients that Drew and I have where they will post on social media and they are performing an exercise that we know is not in their plan. Uh, uh, let's take, for example, which I still don't understand, a leg press where the girl is facing like this and they're doing this. Yeah. So if my client posts that on social media, the first thing I do is call them. <laughs> and I say, <laughs> hey, this movement is not in your program. What's going yeah. on? Okay. And Nine times out of 10, what they tell me is, oh, I know, I just did that to film it, to post it on social media. Mm. Okay, why? Yeah. Well, that movement is very eye-catching. Mm -hmm. So here's the first thing to realize too, is that even girls on my team, sometimes they're just posting videos for views. Yeah. And it's not necessarily what is in their training program, an mm -hmm. exercise that looks different, that looks unique, that looks cool, whatever the case may be, they're maybe posting that for likes. Okay. Yes. So I, I just, you know, we go back to the comparison game, right? With the sport. Mm -hmm. It's it's so it's so hard. Every time I get on a call with a client about posing, training, well, I saw this person doing this. Okay, but you don't know the context of the entire situation. We don't right. know what they're even doing this every day. We don't know if maybe they need it. We, we don't know what the case is. And it's so hard True. to compare yourself to someone in this sport. So that's the first thing to realize, I think, is like, you know, to me, the difference between a, a fit influencer and a bodybuilder, just to be very honest and transparent with you, that the bodybuilding, if you look at it, is going to look really boring. Yeah, It's going to look like meats and potatoes. It's going to look like the same movements. It's going to look like the mundane, boring day after day, week after week. That is bodybuilding. Yep. A fit influencer is somebody who's going into the gym every day, doing something different every day, every week. There's no kind of progressive overload. There's single leg. There's this leg. There's this leg up in the air. There's this arm in the air. I'm going to hang from these ropes. It's it's eye-catching. The mm -hmm. more sexy it is, it's probably more of that fit influencer. That's right. That's right. No, that's absolutely true. You know, that's, that's, <clears throat> that's a great point because it translates over to everything in – our sport, not just training, but also diet, things like that too. You see them go out and they have these huge cheat meals. Okay, they maybe they maybe they have a bite and they don't eat it. You know what I mean? Stuff like that. You got to remember that 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 what you see online. This is across the board. What you see online is not real life. It's not real life. So you may end up getting your program from your coach or something, and it looks boring. And you're like, but this is not what so and so did. Well, you don't even know if so and so did that. To be honest with you. <laughs> Yeah, uh, you know they probably didn't. They could be just doing something to, you know, maybe they maybe their trainer is trying to, you know, sell a program for beginners or something like that or whatever it might be. So they're the ones that are demoing it for their trainer, you know. Yeah. So they may not actually train like that. Exactly. You know? They may yeah. actually be, be the one doing that stuff. So just because they're doing a certain thing online does not mean they're actually doing that in real life. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and we're going to show, I would like to show my logbook first. If you first, have that okay. Up. Um, and when we get into that, 
so, you know, the thing to think about, you know, when I have learned how to train, obviously everybody knows I graduated with my exercise science degree, but I've been very clear that like when I graduated from there, that was not the, the most of my education. I learned my education from my, my own findings and from being taught by really excellent trainers. So I, I brought this up for you guys so you could kind of see, this is my logbook. Um, so this was my shoulder A day that I actually completed yesterday. Um, I track in a logbook and I track in a logbook, number one, to get the hell off my phone because if I'm on my phone, I'm, I'm distracted. I have yeah. lots of emails, lots of people kind of trying to contact me. So obviously you see here that it's written. Um, and I also just find it easier to like make notes or um, like if you see like some of the weights or the check marks are circled, that's telling me that's the same weight that I want to do next week like that okay. was good I want to keep it here <clears throat> stars um, next to the letters mean that that was a PR for me that week okay. um, and, and check marks just mean that it was the same weight uh, from the previous set so as you see here on my shoulder a day one two three four but six exercises here okay um, what I want to show you guys is that my my a movement is always like a warm-up movement so really lightweight just kind of you know getting things started not really trying to progressive overload here i am very big on progressive overload style training um it's scientifically proven it works i do not believe in that thought of you have to you know continuously switch the movements and the movement patterns so you confuse the body <laughs> to me that's bs yep. uh, your body is a machine and it gets it gets more and more adaptive the more that you give it the same stimulus it learns yeah. how to get that stimulus better and better and better and better so mm -hmm. um my my movement patterns really don't change all that much throughout the year what you'll notice though when we go into the compound movement so i have a standing overhead press here but if you notice that i have rep ranges so uh -huh. five sets of six to eight reps so what that allows me to do is it allows me to play with the weight and progressive overload so let's take that last set for example because the last set you can theory theoretically say is your, is your last set your heaviest set so i did 37 and a half pounds so i progressed uh -huh. from 25 which i'm going to call like a feeder set or a warm-up set and i did 12 reps and then I went into my working set. So I progressed from 35 to 37 and a half pounds, and I ended at eight reps. What I could do next week now to progress this is I have wiggle room in my rep scheme. So yep. if I wanted to increase the weight and then bring my reps back down to down. six, mm -hmm. that's still a progression next week. Yep. Or if I made a note there on the side, like I had like, you know, shoulder pain or, you know, eight was really, really heavy, or maybe I needed to even back down the weight because that last set was just terrible form. I was moving my back and things like that. I still have wiggle room to progress. Yep. So this is where I like to use a lot of rep ranges within my training and my clients mm -hmm. training. It gives them some more autonomy to be <clears throat> able to make better decisions yep. to be able to progress the workout. And if you notice in a building phase, obviously the reps are lower. So yep. we're, we're the, the highest rep scheme we get here is 12 reps with the cable frontal raises. Everything else is really low. Do I believe in working till failure? Yes, absolutely. But here's the bottom line. Most females do not work till failure. Yeah. They are not working till true failure. True failure being you do not have one more left in the tank by the time that six or eight rep comes around. Yep. So with upper body especially i tell my girls all the time like you're gonna have to get uncomfortable with asking people for spotting and asking mm -hmm. people for help in the gym um or you're just gonna have to be really really mindful of working up till two reps in the tank i feel like two reps in the tank is heavy enough but still safe enough that they feel yeah. like they can push heavy yep. um this is a, a really good example to me of like a perfect style of training if you notice it's just min minimal exercises but by the time this workout is over and this workout took me 60 minutes yesterday i was gassed yeah absolutely gassed because i'm making every single set intentional and yep. worth it well yeah. that and then also just to, to piggyback on this because you know obviously my training is now set up very similar to yours because drew did mine but he took away all but one of my upper body days so you have to remember depending on who you are I don't need to progress my upper body. <laughs> I got plenty. <laughs> so, and I have two upper body days because right. I need to progress my upper body. Right. There goes oh, some you balloons. Got balloons. <laughs> <laughs> what 
whatever. It's AI shit. I get it. <laughs> so going back to the training intensity, I mean, he even mentioned in the notes, you know, I don't want you murdering yourself and this stuff. I don't want you annihilating your upper body because we don't need any more of it. You know, so it goes back to understanding that your training intensity doesn't necessarily need to be go to failure if that is not what you need to do for that particular body part. Like myself, I don't need to go to failure right now. I can, Correct. but it, it's not going to help me. It's not going to yep. help me. I need to just keep my body where it is. And again, he didn't take it completely out because I don't want to lose my upper body. But at the same time, we still want to stimulate it. We still want to make sure that we're that we're keeping those areas full and round and all those kinds of things. But I don't need to grow it anymore. So, you know, in order to, to, to keep it where it is, I still need to challenge myself, but not push myself so hard where I'm going to overgrow it, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. Which I think you can now go to that RPE scale. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people ask all the time, like, well, how do I know if, like, I'm working hard enough? Like, is it a heart rate thing? Should I be working to, like, a active calorie burn? Or, And it's really hard because that's so person dependent. Like, you can't really rely on your heart rate in a terms of intensity. Because if you, let's say, let's say before bodybuilding, you were a marathon runner, right? Mm -hmm. You were really aerobic. Your resting heart rate is going to be so much lower than me who has never run a day in my life unless someone's chasing me. Yeah. Because you're so fit aerobically. Mm -hmm. So with your resting heart rate may be somewhere in the 40s to 60s, which is low. And then when you start exercising, maybe you can't even get your heart rate to over 100, where I could get mm -hmm. to 140 to 160 beats per minute in an intense session like that because I'm less uh, conditioned than you, right? So yes. heart rate and active calories burned is very individualized per person and if we're setting an active calorie target and like somebody asked me off the cuff like what should my active calorie be for shoulder day um i need more data like i yeah. need like three to four weeks of data to be able to kind of tell you that yep. so if we bypass that completely this is called an rpe scale have you ever heard of a vo2 max test yes mm -hmm. okay so yep. that's when you have like the um you have the mask on your face and you're on a treadmill and you're trying to find aerobic capacity. Yep. Well, when you're on the treadmill and they're trying to ask you how hard you're working, they obviously cannot speak. So they use this RP test. So when the person says, hey, how hard are you working? They can put, they could throw up a seven or they could throw up a nine. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And what this actually does is it, it actually helps the person gauge where their heart rate is as well. Because if you're working, let's say in that nine, very uh -huh. hard activity, we could assume that your heart rate is probably somewhere around 90. Yep. Okay. Yep. Max effort yep. your heart rate is somewhere hundred or above. So you basically yep. just put a zero after all of these, after all of the one to two to three. Uh -huh. So what I like to do with people that are having a hard time, you know, tracking progress and things like that is give them the RP skill. And within your training, I like to say you should be working anywhere between eight to nine. You, you should be working through eight to nine for each set. Not that it should feel like that the entire workout, but oh, when you get to the most intense. These, yeah, these peaks and valleys of yep. intensity and then drop off. Mm -hmm. So this is something, if you're interested in this, you guys can message me or you know DM me on Instagram. We'd be happy to give this to you. This is what I use for my clients when we're kind of having these conversations we're talking about right now. Mm -hmm. But this is for you to self-assess and self-aware what intensity yeah. is and where you're at and what you're feeling within this scale. If right. you're anywhere under eight, I would say you're leaving room on the table for yep. intensity and for gains. Yeah. And that's a great point too, because the fact that you actually check on your clients about that kind of stuff is important because I see this a lot personally when I watch people in the gym, I know their competitors, you know, I know who their coaches are, whatever. And they're working at a two or a three. And I'm like, you, you, you can't expect your body to progress just because you're standing in the gym. Like this is, that's not how that works. You have to actually have that intensity behind it. And going back to what you mentioned about the marathon runner as well, depending on where you are in your, in your progression, whether you're in season, off season, whatever, that this is going to change. You know, when I go and do my cardio, it takes me two minutes to raise my hand, my heart rate right now. When I'm, when I'm in, when I'm in prep, it takes me like 10 minutes to get my heart rate to go up because yes. I'm more, I'm better conditioned. I'm in a, in because you're doing shape. more cardio during that right. time and getting in shape more. Yeah. Exactly. Like all I have to do is freaking step. I have my, my elliptical machine here in my, in my other office. And all I have to do is step on that thing. My heart rate's over 130. Exactly. <laughs> you know, and <laughs> but, exactly. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But not and even to be close. Fair, I think a lot of people who are working in between that two to six category, they think that that is their their limit. That's right. And my first coach was that's what I, I always say this. He taught me intensity. He yeah. taught me how to go into the gym. And when my brain says stop, how much more I actually have to give. Yeah. 
And unfortunately, I think that that's really the only way for someone that's working between this two to six category and thinking that they're that that's their max. They need to be taught that Absolutely. they can be more intense. Absolutely. Something that I really started working on this year is kind of pushing my own ego aside and telling my clients to go hire a trainer. Yep. Take my program, hire a trainer, tell them this is what I want you to take me through, but I want you to teach me how much I can push. Yes. And I've had a lot of a success with this the last few months. I mean, my yeah. clients are like, holy, holy moly. I didn't realize how much weight I could do, how yep. much more I could push, mind and muscle connection and things like that. And at the end of the day, those trainers are helping me. They're my eyes right. and physical, you know, they're teaching them this. So right. if you feel like you have more to give, but you're not sure how or how much or go hire a trainer, talk to yeah. a coach. Go and Absolutely. even if it's temporary and then yep. you just use what you built or what you learned and you take it from there on your own. That way you can get to that eight to nine range. So a lot of bodybuilding is about being honest with yourself. And we always talk about it, getting uncomfortable. If you're in the gym and you're leaving that gym and it's like a checkbox effort, like, okay, I did it. Yay. Ooh, mm -hmm. did it. <laughs> Probably have some room to leave on the table. I mean, yeah. there's some days that I get in that car and I'm, I have to sit there for 10 minutes because I'm like, my soul just left my body. Like, yeah. I can't yeah. move right now, you know? Yeah. So it's just about being honest with yourself and being real with yourself. And if you are being real with yourself and you know you have room to on the table, what can you then do to fix it? Yep. Take actionable steps to make that happen. That's right. You know, and, and that brings up a good point too on the hiring a trainer. Make sure you get a good trainer that knows what they're doing that are going to push you. Of course. You know, just having somebody, like a lot of people will rely on training partners too, which is great. Yes. Like if you've got somebody that's a, that, you know, that is in the same sport as you or something like that, and you guys are going to push each other, that's phenomenal. You know, it doesn't necessarily, it doesn't necessarily have to be a certified trainer that's going to push you to your limits. As long as you're doing things correctly, it could just be somebody that, that pushes you in the gym, period. It could be your best friend. You know what I mean? Something like that. Um, and it's just, it's just a matter of what's going to work best for you. And I know like for myself, the first time I really had a, a trainer in the gym was when I had an injury and I wanted to work my way back to being normal. And it was just a matter of like, I, I didn't want to push myself too hard to the point where I was going to hurt myself again, that kind of thing. But it taught me a lot as far as like form and intensity and all this kind of stuff, just having that other person next to me, like correcting things, you know what yeah. I mean? And sometimes that's all you need. Sometimes that's all you need. Sometimes you just need somebody to take you through for a month or something like that. So then you can in increase that. Now you're like, okay, now I actually know how hard I can push myself. Absolutely. You know, and yeah. that, that may be the only thing, thing that you actually need or just simple things like going out and, and working with Drew and just reassessing how my body is put together and how I need to move things differently and things like that. All of a sudden I'm like, oh, okay, this, this feels completely different. Now I'm challenge, challenging myself in a new way, in a different way. Absolutely. You know, those things are, I think those are, are important. Just like anything else, like continuing, continued education, continued, you know, improvement upon your intensity, whatever that may be for you, you know, because you're never going to get to a pro athlete status without having that kind of intensity and that pro athlete kind of work ethic and all those kinds of things. If you're, again, just doing a checkbox, your, your body knows you're just doing a checkbox. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's no, like, I love that. <laughs> like your body's smart. <laughs> so yeah. you, you have to challenge it. You have to challenge it and you have to, you have to push it harder. So if you don't feel like you're doing that, you need to change something. You need Absolutely. change something. I mean, so, I've been doing this for four years and every year my training is different, Tr uh -huh. different in the way of the, the thought process behind it, the same yeah. kind of exercises Perfect. and things like that, but the emphasis behind it and the structure behind it has been different yeah. every year. And that's yeah. why I continue to evolve and change still at 32 years old in the uh -huh. sport of bodybuilding, because right. I am so willing to put my own ego aside, ask yeah. for help, get a different resources and try different things because not one way is the best way. Absolutely. Um, and if you're doing the same thing still after three years and then still commenting that you need more improvements, then I would argue that you need to do something different, right? The definition right. of insane, talk about that all the time. So, yeah. and that, yes, as, as a pro, like whether you're an amateur or you are a current pro, you should always be training like a pro with a pro mindset, mm -hmm. pro mentality. Mm -hmm. You know, a professional bodybuilder walks into the gym every day and that hour is their job. 
right? Yep. So you have to think about like, you're not answering emails when you're up, you know, in, in, in a work meeting. You're yeah. not talking on the phone when you're in a work meeting with someone or meeting with a client. You are very focused on that client. You're very focused on that connection and whatever you're doing in that time. And the gym should be the same exact way. If you mm -hmm. want to be a professional, treat the gym like a professional job. Put your yeah. phone on do not disturb, have an outline and a plan. I find it very, very like soulless and peaceful before I go to the gym, like putting everything in my logbook, making the intention of the workout, what I want to do that day and things like that. And that's planning for success, just like you would do in your own job. That's right. Absolutely. And something else you could do too, because I think, again, some of the times in this sport, what we do is what you mentioned at the beginning of this is we watch people on Instagram, YouTube, and things like that. One thing you can do is go outside of our sport right? Go look at football players, go look at, you know, soccer players, go look at wrestlers, go look at these people that train with high intensity that are actual athletes and see how they train. You know, they, they are freaking puking on the field at the end of, the, of practice. You know what I mean? That's a professional athlete. Correct. You know, that's professional athlete intensity. Yes. If you're not, if you're not doing that and you're just, you still look pretty at the end of your workout. I, yeah, no. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I don't get it. <laughs> I'm like, I definitely don't look pretty at the end of my workout. <laughs> and I'll say like this I too, said. like, like you have to adjust too. Like, I, you know, a lot of times when I go to the gym, I try to bundle everything together. So I'll do my training and then I'll do my cardio after. Well, this past week when I was doing these new training programs with that, that Drew set up and stuff, I was like, there's no way I can do cardio after this. I've only got 15 minutes of cardio, but I was like, no, it's not happening. I, I'm like, I'm going to have to do it tomorrow. I can't. I, I can, can never do cardio post workout. <laughs> I was like, this is not not going to work, not going to work. Yep. So you start restructuring so that you can put the intensity. And I'll tell you what, too, this is the other thing as well. My my cardio intensity has been better this week because I haven't been doing it coupled with my pairing or there coupled with my training. So it's, you know, I've been doing it separately and I'm like, oh, I can, I can really push for the 15 minutes versus trying to put it all in one spot and be like, eh. Just and that's a good thing it. to know for prep yeah. too. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. that I always do fasted cardio, not because of fasted cardio, but because that's when I can push the best yeah. and then give me time to recover for my training later on in the day. Yeah. That yeah. way I'm giving a hundred percent to both energy expenditure sessions. Yep. In prep, I know a lot of girls try to go back to back, but unfortunately one's gonna suffer over the other if they're back to back. Either you're Absolutely. gonna put hundred percent of your lift, which I would prefer, and then yep. you know, basic on cardio. But if you just structure your, your day around a little bit. And you can give 100% uh -huh. to both, get everything you need to be, get done in the day, work, things like that. Then you can get 100% out of everything. Yep. If you're willing to wake up a little bit earlier or stay up a little bit later for people uh -huh. like to do late cardio, that, that's a really good point. I always split my cardio up during prep. Like yeah. once I get over, once I get over 20 minutes, I start splitting it because I, I know I can go intense for, for 20 minutes, but once I get past that 20, 20 minute mark, stuff starts suffering. So I know I have to split it up. I definitely suggest the split if that's what you need to do. Like if any, I try to keep it all together, even if I'm at 60 or 90 minutes and I just yeah. do it first thing in the morning and give it hard, hard, hard effort. And then mm -hmm. I have that time down and rest. I like knowing it when my workout's done because I go so intense, I'm done, mm -hmm. you yeah. know, and, and that's just it. Like here's two different people, two different pros and they structure things differently, but it works for us. Yep. And what ultimately it's a mind shift at the end of yep. the day, right? It's like, what mm -hmm. does my Mind, what can my mind handle? <laughs> yeah. No, I had I somebody, I mentioned that I split my cardio up and I had somebody in my, um, in my, uh, stories say, but doesn't that defeat the purpose? I'm like, no, you're still burning just as many calories. I was yeah. like, and you're still getting your heart rate up. You're still taxing your body just as much, if not more. Like you think about revving a car engine, the more you rev it, the more gas that you burn. You know, if you break it up, you're probably revving it a little bit harder. You know? Yeah. If you have a 40 minute session and 20 minutes of that, of that continuous session is you doing minimal effort yeah. versus 20 minutes of high to moderate and then another 20 minutes of moderate. I'd much rather that. Absolutely. Than just Absolutely. going through the most. So split mm -hmm. it up however you need to. I tell people all the time, just split it up however you need to have the maximum effort in each session that you can and Absolutely. show up your best every day. Not every day is going to be a hundred percent. If, mm -hmm. But if you have 40% to give that day and you show up and give 40%, you're still giving 100% of yourself Absolutely. that day. And that happens in prep all the time. Not every day is going to be 100. There's going to be days where you have lighter energy, that your brain fog is high, that you're just in a bad mood, whatever it is. But just give 100% of whatever you have for that that's day. Insane. And that's still yeah. a successful day. That's still yeah. intensity. Yep. No, I had somebody ask, ask me about the training too this week because I, I mentioned how mentally taxing it is. She was like, so are you still going to be able to do your training when you're done with, with work? Because I, I tend to do it at the end of once I've done all my, my 
computer stuff, you know, and then I go train. And um, she's like, since you have to focus on it so much, I said, oh yeah. I said, I'd much rather still do it at the end. I said, because then I can put my full focus on it and my, my brain isn't diverted back to work. I was like, yeah, it's mentally taxing. I said, but, but at the same time, I'm like, if I do it in the morning, this is me personally, if I do it in the morning, I'm thinking about everything I have to do during the day. Absolutely. I said, I'd rather do it when I get all my work done and I can go focus solely 100% on my training. And absolutely, I can still get it done that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. So, for and sure. Then you got you, you got to know what, what works for you. You know, you got to know what what piece of this is going to make you stick to it. You know, um, and it's different if you're just in a. You know, we're not even talking about lifestyle, but you're different if you're in a lifestyle um, situation where, you know, th- this is just a matter of making you healthy. You know, for us, we're talking about pushing ourselves to the next level as professional athletes. It's different. You know, Absolutely. if you yeah. if you're just trying to be a normal person, get it done when you can get it done. You know yes. what I mean? Yeah, this is not for lifestyle. This is <laughs> right. for athletes for yeah. sure. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. And I think it just ultimately what clouds a lot of the judgments, like going back to the original thought, is social media. You know, the yes. comparison game, um, you know, top trainers within the industry that have come out over the last couple of years making a lot of absolute statements and mm-hmm. you have to train like this and you have to mm-hmm. do your dress like this. And Unfortunately, I just feel like it really muddies the water, mud- muddles the waters in a lot of yes. ways where just take your hip thrust, a normal hip thrust, execute it the right way and progressive overload it. Like Absolutely. it's really that simple at the end of the day. If you really take it down into the simplistic thought of it, it's it's not about you need to be in absolute hip flexion and the, the, like people just try to overcomplicate things. And I always tell people to go back to the business side when you hear absolute yes. statements like that. If somebody's trying to sell an ebook or trying to sell mm-hmm. training, or trying to sell something that they're selling, yep. <laughs> I, I have a really hard time with that. So, you know, ultimately it's, it's simple. It's taking it down to the very simplest of find the exercises that work for you and that you need to build your physique, mm-hmm. master the form and the mind to muscle yes. connection, find good tempo work, and then slowly progressive overload from there. Mm-hmm. Each week, I do not make a PR on all of my lifts. Mm-hmm. That would be absolutely impossible. Yep. But as long as I'm being honest with myself each week of, hey, I didn't increase weight or sets this week, but I still feel really, really good 10 out of 10 connection, mm-hmm. that's good for me. Yep. That's perfect. Either. And the other thing, that's a good point that you just made there too. Like depending on the space that you're in, we're in bodybuilding. We're not in strongman or powerlifting. No. Know? So absolutely. it doesn't matter. doesn't matter how much we lift doesn't matter what our PRs are. That stuff doesn't no. matter. You no. know, what matters it's like It's not a said, strong form. competition. Mm-hmm. Of course, form. we all want to be strong, but that's not the goal of bodybuilding. So if mm-hmm. we're just focusing on this goal, it is not, it just doesn't matter how much weight you press. Yep. <laughs> Aesthetics versus performance, which we talked about last week with the whole men's wellness thing. <laughs> that's it. Aesthetics versus it's two, performance. It's two different things. It's two different goals. So, because yeah. I get people ask me that all the time, like when it comes to, um, wanting to go into bodybuilding. I don't lift that heavy. You don't have to. You don't have to. You don't have to. And you don't have to see your favorite influencer pressing 40 pounds and think that you have to be there. And the opposite is true too. Just because your favorite Mm -hmm. influencer is pressing 20 pounds and you're pressing 40 and you're like, oh, maybe it's just the comparison game has to stop because it's, it's so individualized. It is yes. such an individualized approach. And while I understand that, you know, especially newer competitors and amateurs and things like that, they learn a lot from watching other people. It's, it's really important to come back to the focus of who is this person? What is their goal? What's the intent behind the post? And really try to kind of filter what you're reading or watching in that way. Yeah, absolutely. I'm checking the ego at the door. Yeah. I tell people that too, like, you know, you've, you've seen Dan, my husband is six foot two, 225, 30 pounds of an ale where he's at this season. <laughs> and he goes into the gym and if he's doing like, you know, rear delts or something, he drops his weight down to 20 pounds. You know yeah. what I mean? I'm like, if a dude that big can put his ego aside and pick up the 20 pound dumbbells, you can do that too. Yeah. <laughs> You know, like weight it's doesn't really matter that if you're not targeting that muscle. Mm-hmm. Weight, it doesn't matter. Mm-mm. And we see that a lot. Like that's just a pet peeve of mine. I see that with a lot of girls with their trap development, things like that too. Drop the weights, drop the weights, drop the weights. Focus on time under tension. Focus on form. Focus on what you're actually hitting versus pulling. Yeah, like on a dumbbell lateral raise, I cannot get over 15 pounds ever. Yeah. Like yeah. ever. Uh, in my entire being, I've never been. If I'm doing them single, I can do 20. If I'm doing them double, I do 15. Uh, yeah, I just can't. And that's okay. I'm still yeah. getting great lateral delts. And I've been told to stop to stop lifting my upper body. That's it. And I've been told to stop lifting my upper body because it's big enough. 
<laughs> Remember, you did start in figure, so. I did. And again, that goes back to genetics, you know? That goes back to what you're actually born with. I, the reason why I started competing in the first place is because everybody told me I had swimmer shoulders because I'm, bi- I'm big, built big up top. That's how I'm built. That's yep. how I was born. So I'm going to train differently than somebody yep. who has a hard time growing their upper body. You know what I mean? And again, this didn't happen overnight. I mean, you see the pictures from when I started with Jamie you know, almost four years ago. It was, it was, I, wasn't, I wasn't big, you know, but I just genetically have that predisposition to be able to grow the shoulders and the biceps and the back and all that kind of stuff a whole lot bigger than a lot of girls. And, you know, figure, figure was me for a reason. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> so yeah. any, um, any closing thoughts that you have on the, on the training intensity that you wanted to say that you didn't yet? yet? Um, no, I mean, the only thing I would say is like, if you find something online or that you're questioning, like, I love to educate. So like, I love when my girls are like, Hey, and they'll send it to me and they'll be like, what is this and why? And, and you know, like, I don't, I don't ever like to put something down. I tell the trainers at my gym all the time that work for me. You don't have to have an idea that I necessarily agree with as long as you tell me the why behind it. Yeah. Right. So the same thing goes when somebody sends me something and they have an idea and they're like, Jordan, what is this exercise? Why are they doing this? Like, is this something I should be doing? And sometimes I'll be like, yeah, that is a good exercise. Let's go ahead and add that in or this is give it a try. Or I'll say, no, and this is why. I'm always going to have a why behind something. And I feel like every coach should, a a good coach should. So if you're questioning something or if you find something online that you want to learn more about, send it to your coach and ask, you know, and learn the whys behind things. And I think that will only expand your knowledge into what your program is and it allows you to really focus on your program and know that it's the right one for you. Or for some people, maybe you start to realize that your program maybe isn't designed the right way for you based mm-hmm. off what you're seeing online, which happens a little bit, but happens. Um, yep. So I think just having that open line of communication with your coach always with any kind of questions or anything, just to get that clarification so you understand the why behind things. Yeah. And I would say too, because that's the same thing that I did when I was doing my assessment with Drew. Like he asked me if there was any um, exercises that I didn't, feel right or I didn't didn't like or whatever that were in my current program. We went through a handful of those. I said, I, you know, whenever I get to this specific exercise, I always swap it out because I don't like the way that it feels and I don't feel like I'm hitting where I'm supposed to be hitting. He's like, okay, cool. We don't have to do those anymore. You know, that kind of thing. So there's nothing wrong with questioning stuff. Again, going back to, or like there was another one I said, I was like, I don't think I'm quite hitting this one right. It's not feeling right. He's like, well, let's do it this way so that you know you're hitting it in the right spot. You know, yeah. okay, cool. Awesome. You know, well, now we can keep doing that. So, yeah. you know, there's, there's ways to, um, to communicate those kinds of things too, you know, yes. just, just and, ask. Yeah. And a coach shouldn't be threatened or mad when you no. say, Hey, a B stance doesn't work for me. I feel it all in my back. I've done everything yeah. you've said. Can we just get this switched out? Absolutely. Yeah. It's not for everybody. So if you mm-hmm. just like you just said, Jashawn, if you're seeing that something on your plan that your coach gave you and you're skipping it, or you know, you're supposed to be feeling it in your glutes and you're not. Just ask them to substitute it out. There are so many different exercises that you could be doing. So yeah. absolutely, like make the most of your training. And we only know as coaches, based on your feedback, how to adjust the plan. So like if yes. you're just skipping something and you're not telling us that something doesn't feel right, well, we don't know that. So we don't know how to help you better. So just keep communicating because we've talked about this training and bodybuilding is very, very important. So this yes. piece and this communication with your coach is highly important. That way we can keep making adjustments each week, every six weeks, whatever it is, to make sure that you stay in the program and progressing. Absolutely. All right, cool. So let's go through two user questions before we finish out for today. Let's jump into this one because I think it kind of relates to what we were just talking about. So Perfect. this was the question was, I'm a beginner and I have to put on a lot of muscle. Is it realistic to build at 10 pounds up from my stage weight? So basically they're asking, can they stay within 10 pounds of their stage weight if they have to put a lot of muscle on? Um, and what is your thought process on this particular question? What do you think? Number one, it depends. It depends. <laughs> It depends what you look like, yes, how high yes, your foot correct. is, things like that. What your but, actual stage weight was and if you were conditioned enough, you know, those kinds of things. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. So it depends. But I would say for most in my experience, a beginner, first time competitor has never been a stage, you're going to have to gain more than 10 pounds of what yes. you, your perceived or last stage weight is. It's just mm-hmm. the way it goes. You know, yes. if you have to put on a ton of muscle, you're probably going to be way over that 10 pound mark. Of course, as coaches, I always say, it's not our goal for you to gain a ton of body fat. Our goal mm-hmm. is to gain right and at the end of the day by the time that 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 growing season's over it's my job as your coach to get all that that body weight off so of course my goal is to keep you as 
lean as possible. But the science is you have to be in a caloric surplus to build muscle. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. just like when we're cutting and we can't say, hey, keep my muscle and only get rid of my fat, the same thing goes when you're when you're reversing. Yes. You can't just say, hey, grow muscle, but don't grow fat. They come together and they lose together. Yes. Um, so I would say that 10 pounds in the first two improvement seasons is probably not enough. It's mm -hmm. probably needs to be higher. Um, yeah, that, that, but again, it depends. It's, it's a dependent person dependent. You also have to remember the kind of weight, like you just said, the fat versus muscle and stuff like that too. If you're putting on muscle, you're going to hold more water. You're going to hold more glycogen inside of your muscle, which is going to make you weigh more. That's Great just point. how it is. You know what I mean? So, you know, I go back to when I look at my, my stage photos from 2018, Versus my 2000, my, my stage photos from now, 2023, I was 10 pounds heavier on stage. So, you know, you, you got to remember like that, that, that equates to a lot of weight when you're off stage. And that's somebody who's been in the industry for 15 years. That's not Correct. a newbie. This is not a newbie. Right. So again, it's person dependent. I'm also five, nine, I'm a big girl. So I'm going to have to put more size on in general anyway. So I agree with you. I think, I think just putting out that blanket 10 pounds statement is dangerous because then you start feeling like you're failing a failure if you're going over it. Yeah. I, 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 I know like I did. Failing. Yeah, I did. My first mm -hmm. two seasons as an amateur, I was confused when people would say you shouldn't be 15 pounds up from stage weight. And here I was sitting at 25 and I'm like, yes. and I'm only growing more, you yes. know, and it made me feel like I was doing something wrong and a failure, but it, I wasn't, it's just That's what right. was needed at the time. That's right. So yeah, I, I agree with that. I, I have a really hard time with that. I talk about with that with Celeste all the time. You know, uh -huh. these absolute statements from coaches of you need to be this X amount a pound over stage weight. Everybody's so different that way. Yes. Like it's 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 so hard to say that. And I don't really think is. that it's a failure. If you're 20 plus pounds over stage weight if the if the goal is if still in quality. mind and we're exactly exactly yeah. and and you know off seasons too. Jamie Jamie and I have yeah keep talking about this off seasons are just about the mental flexibility as it is the physical flexibility. It's about being able to go date your spouse again and having moments of saying yes. And you have to have balance in this sport or the longevity of the sport is going to run out for you. Absolutely. You're going to be so burnt out. And so the coaches that make you stay, you know, in this box in the off season, I feel like that causes more mental stress. Absolutely. And long-term, um, you know, body dysmorphia and issues and things like that. I mean, I hate to say it. It's almost like a controlled eating disorder. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, it, yeah. It, but it, it is, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a disorder at the end of the day, you know, and, and again, going back to some people thrive in that environment. So again, this is Absolutely. all person, person dependent. This is all yes. person dependent, you know, so that that's fine. But I'm just saying like, if you are mentally stressed out over going and having dinner with your husband or your wife or your kids or whatever, that's a problem. Something's up. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. That's a so I think if you're over 10 pounds up from stage weight as an amateur, you're probably doing the right thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I know for me, like as soon as I, again, as soon as I start eating more and my muscles fill back out, I'm up, you know, six, seven, eight pounds within two weeks. Yeah. So if I was trying to stay that, that, that spot in that spot for, I've had years of off seasons, there's no way, there's no way. Yeah. And I look back at that and I'm like, man, I'm so lean. You yeah. Know, again, I and I'll tell you so lean. Yeah. And I'll tell you guys this too, because I know this for a fact, me, myself and three other of Jamie's pro Olympians, I'm not going to name names because I don't obviously have their consent. We are all 15, 18 pounds up from our stage weight. So they've all come into town. They've seen Drew. They've done training. Obviously we're like, Hey, like how much do you weigh? Like things like that. We are all sitting in our off season, 15, 18 pounds up from stage weight, but we're healthy. We're all yeah. growing. All yeah. of us are growing. All of us feel this mental flexibility. All of us are married. So we're, you know, having more date nights and stuff with our husbands. So that way when Jamie goes, hey, we're dropping the hammer on prep, we can then go back, yeah. back into that mental that focus. Mode. Absolutely. So Absolutely. here we are as pro Olympians, not 10 pounds up from stage weight. We're right. so much higher than that. So. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, again, we always go back to it's person dependent. It, there's always a, it depends factor there, but you're not failing if you're over 10 pounds. You're not, no. No. you're not failing. Okay. For, Great for, a lot, for a lot of people, you're failing if you are staying within 10 pounds. <laughs> so, yeah. you know what I mean? If, especially if you got to put weight on, like if you got to put size on, you got to put size on. <laughs> yeah. You know, you need to put size on, you don't have a cycle back. How does your lab yeah. work? I, you know, yeah.
as well. Yeah. Like I said, like, it depends. There's yes. so much more. There's always a, it depends, but yeah, great yes. question. Absolutely. So good, good question. Um, and then the second question I was going to pull up for this week was uh, best methods to reduce inflammation from hard training that week other than just rest. What's, what's some very relatable. Ways? Very, yeah. very relatable. Yes. Yeah, so obviously rest, duh. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But what are some things that you could be doing, you know, on your rest day or even just to help with the inflammation? There is a ton of research out right now about cold plunging. Um, I hate it not myself. Um, <laughs> just, yeah, fuck that. <laughs> I, I, have one in, I have one here in my home. Um, I, it, it, it makes me feel like I'm suffocating, which is yes. one of my, one of my fears. So <sighs> But there's so much research around Dan it. Dan does so it. So Dan takes, we call it Wuzu's. He does cold showers every morning. And not only Greg does he does do cold, yeah, not only does he do cold showers, but now he's got like one of those laundry bags that he puts ice inside of the laundry bag, puts it up on the shower and showers underneath the ice. I'm like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> yeah. But I mean, the research is there. So he's doing it but i mean it does like this cns reset and then obviously we, we've known this for years ice is good for any kind of inflammation right oh you sprain your ankle put your ankle in a yep. in an ice bucket. oh you have this put ice on it right so yep. there it's it's, it's been a, a a well known thought so yes cry cryo i don't really like and everyone that i know that does it they're like i don't really know if i see the benefit but the cold plunge it definitely works mm -hmm. um but other than that i mean just staying on top of recovery so like i'm a really big fan of body work um yeah. lymphatic Same. drainage within your yeah. body work right? If you notice, they always do uh, strokes up to the lymph nodes, which are in your hips and armpits, throat, things like that. So they're always constantly, you know, getting that lymph out. Um, and then like having a Theragun at home is something yeah. really simple that you could do just to help in between those sessions. I, do, I have my Theragun every night. I just kind of roll it over my glutes, my shoulders, things like that. Um, but it's just about recovery, you know, foam yeah. rolling is really good for that as well. So staying on top of stretching, and any kind of recovery services that number one, you can afford, but number two, staying disciplined with them. And the more you do them, the better and better your body's going to feel. Going back to a couple of things you just said, lymphatic massage. I actually done those the week of a show. Like I know it's not, a, yeah, it's not a good idea to do full on massages uh, because you can bruise, actually create inflammation, those kinds of things. But I do the lymphatic, especially if I'm having a hard time going to the bathroom the week of the show that will really help to release some things. So that's something you can do there. Um, I do lymphatic drainage for my tie-ins. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, literally, yeah. they, they yeah. kind of do a little scraping, and then, like, mm -hmm. you know, and then they kind of get my tie-ins released, especially, you know, your prep, inflammation, cardio, yeah. things like that. So if I end my cardio Wednesday, Thursday, I'll get a lymphatic drainage on Thursday, Friday before show. I've seen some good success with that, too. Nice. you got to find a good professional for that. Right. Though. They know what they're doing. Yep. Yeah. Um, that um, red light therapy. There's another one. I have, a, a, great I have one. a red panel in my, in my bathroom. I use that three times a week. Um, it's really good for collagen produ production and things like that too, for your skin and everything as well. Um, magnesium, Epsom salt baths, uh, things like that help too. I do Epsom salt baths at least once a week, if not more, it depends on how much time I have. I think one of the biggest things that people mess up with the, with the Epsom salt is they don't do it long enough. You need to be in the bath for at least 25 to 30 minutes. I stay in the bath for about 40, 45 minutes um, in order to get the full the full drainage effect from it. Um, some people sit in the bath for like 10 minutes. It doesn't actually do anything for you. Um, that, um, all the stretching things that you mentioned. There's something else I was going to mention too, and I can't remember what it was. Oh, oh, compression. Um, compression the, therapy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have compression boots. Those work yes, really I love well. Those. I love yeah, my, I have a hard time with my, my feet, my calves and stuff from posing, you know, wearing your heels and things like that. Compression boots, huge, huge thing. You can get those and freaking sit, sit on your couch, watch TV, you know, and we're good with that. A, there's <laughs> a lot of recovery tools that people have access to. Yeah. I mean, it's really easy now to, to have recovery at home if, mm -hmm. if, if you want it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And then just simple things too, like upping your water intake. You know, things like that. Just simple things you can do to help to drain things out. Sleep. Yeah. Like, like you said, you know, rest. Rest is always a big thing, obviously. But, you know, just in increasing that fluid intake so that you help to release some of the inflammation that way, too. Um, Absolutely. What you're actually eating and intaking through your mouth. You know, if there's certain things that inflame you, whether it's dairy or gluten or whatever it might be, release some of that stuff out. Get more, green, more greens and things like that. You know, uh, stuff like that can, can all help. That can all Absolutely. help. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a great point about the diet. I literally just responded to a check-in yesterday and somebody was like, I just started prep and, 
you didn't, you didn't change my macros yet, but I just changed my food groups around. So they're just uh, doing like more cleaner foods and they feel so uh-huh. much more energized and uh-huh. less inflamed. And your uh-huh. gut is such a big proponent of how you feel in, in every other factor of life, your inflammation, your energy, brain, yep. you know? So yeah, absolutely. And I just actually responded to another check-in this morning of a girl that's on 235 grams of carbs and still feeling sluggish. Uh-huh. So then I go, or my fitness pal and she's just picking like bogged down foods really slow carbs and slow digestion yeah. loading those up with fat so i was like hey let's just kind of change your food groups around this week so that was a really great point of, of what you're putting into your body is a really great example of how you feel yep. internal yep look up the um they can look up the the fodmap diet too so yes. the that's having to do with inflammation and all those kinds of things too so if there's things on there that that make you feel inflamed cut them out stay away from them cut them out you know little things like that um anything else anything else you can think of i don't think so cool awesome those are really good ones yeah good questions this week i have more but what what we're going to try to do is we're going to try and keep this um succinct when it comes to the end of our our podcast we'll do like two questions a week that kind of thing so again feel free to send in uh as many questions as you like and we'll just keep stacking them up and, and answering them as we go along. Uh, but hopefully this was educational for you guys this week. We want to bring things to you that you can always learn from and everything. We've got the Arnold coming up next week. So we'll shoot a podcast before the Arnold. Um, but I will be there all weekend. So if you're there, feel free to say hi. I'll be doing you know interviews and covering the shows and all the fun things since I'm on media again. Woohoo! <laughs> so that's going to be fun times. Um, and that's it. Anything else you wanted to end with before we before we sign out with episode 26? I don't think so. I'll see you guys right. next week. Awesome. Go train hard. Yeah, train hard. Pop the, the headphones in. Shut the world out. Focus on you for that hour that you're in the gym. Just focus on you. Don't focus on anything else. And Go be a you. professional yep. in the gym. Yep, absolutely. All right, guys. Like, subscribe, comment, hit all the bells and whistles, and we'll see you again back here next week behind the bikini. We're out.